Allah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah. And may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and his family and his companions and all those who adhere to his guidance. We ask Allah to make us among the best of those who adhere to his guidance. Allahumma ameen. May Allah write us among the people of the Qur'an that have a distinct loyalty and connection and benefit from his great book. And may Allah allow us to reach the month of Quran, the month of Ramadan, in safety and in Iman. Allahumma ameen. So welcome back everyone. Uh, we insha'Allah Azza wa Jal will dedicate the next two sessions on that very theme of better connecting with the Quran. You know, the book of Allah Azza wa Jal is replete with blessings. It, it's blessed beyond measure, beyond calculation. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarak. A book that we sent down upon you that is blessed. But it being blessed and the one reciting it receiving blessings, all of that comes with the package. But that is not the primary objective for why Allah sent down the Qur'an. Simply for blessings. That is just one of its qualities. Kitabun, a book we sent down upon you. Mubarak, that is blessed. But then he says the purpose. لِيَدَّبَّرُوا ayati, So that they may deeply reflect on its ayat, on its signs or its verses. وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ and so that the people of understanding may recall, may be reminded. So who are the people of understanding? The ones who are reminded. <laughs> that is the idea. And so the true power of the Qur'an, the transformative power of the Qur'an, is found in deeply reflecting on its meanings. In other words, you know, the reward of reciting a verse and you get 10 good deeds for every single letter in every single word of that verse. And the reward of memorizing a verse that you get a level in Jannah uh, for every verse that you memorize. This whole concept, it could be argued that this is all ultimately to bring you closer and closer to the Qur'an so that you may be ultimately transformed by your reflection of it. That is the idea. And even, you know, when Allah Azza wa Jal told us that one of the complaints of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Day of Judgment, Allah will have him complain. We find in Surah Al-Furqan that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala said, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا and the messenger says, Oh my Lord, my people have forsaken this book, have taken this Qur'an as something not worth being treasured, worth being ignored, being abandoned. What does that mean? Who is he complaining of? Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says in his book Al-Fawaid, that yeah, for sure, he's speaking about the disbelievers that have outright rejected the Qur'an, of course, them first. He said, but the abandonment of the Qur'an that places you at the opposite end of the courtroom on the Day of Judgment with the Prophet ﷺ happens on many levels. He mentions five of them and there are more. In his book Al-Fawaid, he says one of them is that when you approach the Qur'an while not seeking from it the mercy it has awaiting you and the cure that it has for your diseases, your illnesses, your infections. He said because Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Qur'an, about the Qur'an, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ We uh, send down out of this Qur'an that which is a shifa, that which is a cure. Not just a dawa, a medicine, because a medicine may or may not have efficacy, may or may not work, right? But a shifa, meaning an effective cure, and a rahma and a mercy for those who believe in it. So for, so for someone to say, I believe in it, but they're not seeking to tap into its mercy and its cure, that's not your approach to the Qur'an, I'm just going to recite some verses here, or I'm just going to hang it there, right? You're not seeking from it. 
what will cure you and grant you access to Allah's mercy, he says that's a lesser form of, may Allah forbid, abandoning the Qur'an. You're not coming to it seeking Allah's light from it for your life. You're not trying to enlighten yourself with it. You're not seeking directions on how you should live. You're not seeking motivation for how you already know you should live, right? These are of the forms of abandoning the Qur'an, memorializing it or tokenizing it in this way. And you know, uh, there is a beautiful story, I, I will mention it quickly, that when the Muslims conquered Al-Mada'in, which was the, the capital of the Sassanid uh, Persian Empire, uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu an, from his you know, intelligence and wisdom, he placed the former Persian as the governor of Al-Mada'in, Salman al-Farisi, Salman the Persian. And when he did that, uh, the people all would flock to Salman, because you know, we always like imagine Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an, as some young man, yeah, because his, his story started as a young man who had a great zeal for the truth and, you know, chose the true religion. But, you know, if you do the math, he was likely older than the Prophet wasallam by the time he met the Prophet wasallam, He was on a journey for a lifetime seeking the truth, right? And so the Prophet wasallam meets him in Medina about 10 years later he dies wasallam. Abu Bakr is the Khalifa Umar is the Khalifa Madain is conquered under Umar then Salman he might be 90 years old at this point okay and he has been collecting wisdom for, the, for those 90 years they used to call him Sayyid or Habr al-Kitabain uh, al-Sifrain that he is like the master scholar of the two books because he collected whatever remained of the books of Christianity per se right until he finally found the Prophet ﷺ, and then he became a master scholar of the Qur'an. So, so when he would enter the masjid, people would flock around him and would not be able you know, to, to wait they, for the gems he would drop, essentially. So one time, he wanted to teach them a lesson about the, the potency of the Qur'an above all else, above human wisdom. And so the people all gathered around and he sat down and he refused to speak till more and more and more and more people came. The crowd built. And after it built, the narrator says was a, there was about a thousand people there. And then he begins to recite to them Surah Yusuf. Just straightforward. No commentary, nothing. Alif <laughs> Lahamra. You know, uh, the whole uh, Surah is on, on the way. They realize he's not stopping. He's not sort of like going to tell them a reflection or anything. They begin to trickle away from the gathering. The narrator says till there was about maybe 10% 10, uh, 10 of them left. Meaning the thousand became like a hundred. Uh, <laughs> 900 people left. And then he sort of showed his, his face, like his actual intent. He, the anger surfaced on his face. And he said to them, Az-zukhruf min al-qawli aradtum. You know, you were waiting for me to say some fancy words, right? You were waiting for me to, uh, in modern language, drop the mic, a mic drop moment, right? Like something so profound you've never heard before. And then I recite to you the book of Allah and you go, oh, we all know Quran. You, you keep it moving. He tell him, that's your problem. You think you know the Quran. If you knew the Quran, if you had a deep relationship with the Quran, you would realize there is no superior wisdom. Even if you roam the earth for 90 years like me, there is no superior wisdom to the wisdom Allah Azza wa Jal revealed for you in this book. And so coming to the Quran as that, seeking from it that transformative wisdom, the direction, the light, the cure, the motivation, the inspiration, that is how you should be uh, coming to Allah Azza wa Jal's book. I'm going to give you like nine tips, okay? To help you reflect on the Quran. The first of them is a very short one, very straightforward. It's called, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Right? You know, the, the scholars even mentioned that in some cases it is mandatory to say before you start reciting, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Because Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ When you recite Qur'an, meaning you're about to recite Qur'an, then seek refuge. Ask Allah to protect you from shaitan. That's already a huge reminder to, to what? What does it remind you of? When you're saying, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ before you start. 
Why are we told say A'udhu Billahi Mishtar Rajeem? At Quran, right? It's not like, you know, you're about to commit a sin, you say A'udhu Billahi Mishtar Rajeem. Allah protect you from shaitan, right? He's suggesting something bad. You're about to recite Quran. Why is it necessary for you to say A'udhu Billahi Mishtar Rajeem? Because shaitan works hard to misguide you, to distract you from taking a deep dive into the Quran. Because shaitan knows the power, he's done. If you're able to perform tadabbur, if you're able to reflect deeply, he's finished. And so he mobilizes <laughs> when you're about to read Quran. And that is why Allah is telling you, I'll take care of him for you. I will, but you say this, a'udhu billah. So the a'udhu billah is not just there you know, to protect you, but also to remind you that shaitan knows the power of what you're about to do. And that is why I'm telling you, seek my protection so you can access that power. That's number one, okay? And this could also be, you know, uh, supplemented with the idea of, you know, making wudu before you hold the mushaf and preparing yourself inside and out. And, but we can come back to that, inshallah, towards the end. The second thing, second key, or like base on our treasure map, inshallah, to, to you know, unlock tadabbur, unlock deep reflection, is when you recite the Qur'an, even in English, by the way, even in translation, this, this advice still works, inshallah, all of it. Reflect on your own needs, because the same ayah could benefit different people in different ways based on how they subject themselves or the state they're in when they subject themselves to that ayah. The, a simple example, uh, when you say Maliki Yawmiddin, owner of the Day of Judgment, if you are saying that, w recognizing your need for strength, you will be strengthened by this ayah, if you're feeling weak at the moment. Allah is the owner of the greatest day. So why do I feel right now sort of uh, bullied by my boss or threatened by my partner or you know overwhelmed by my circumstance if Allah is the owner of the greatest day then he's also the owner of every lesser day right and on the flip side if you're feeling a little uh, full of yourself feeling a little pompous and you read Maliki Yawmiddin and you're looking to cure yourself Allah Azza wa Jal may cure you from that right and remind you that, hey, Allah is the owner of the greatest day. That means for sure he's the owner of today as well. We don't own anything. We don't even own our next breath. What are we getting all, you know, big in the head for? What are we getting all uh, deluded for? Or he, here's another one. You know, as Dr. Ali Al-Fifi very beautifully uh, extracted, he said so many people are in need of being cured from the illness of judging a book by its cover. <laughs> you see how someone's dressed, you automatically pass a judgment, a value judgment on them. Simply by sort of the value, the monetary value of the clothes they're wearing. Right? He said, but look at, this was in, on his reflections in his book on Yusuf alayhi salam. He says, look at Yusuf alayhi salam. He is caught outside the door or at the door with his shirt ripped off. At that moment, his shirt was ripped, why? Because of his chastity, his dignity. So sometimes people may be wearing clothing that is beneath what you would wear because they have more dignity than you, right or wrong. They may be sort of in, in you know, a compromised condition, dressed subpar, because sometimes they're more virtuous than you. They're not trying to, uh, they were rushing to catch salah. Or they don't want to uh, live on more than their means. They didn't want to sort of uh, get involved in, uh, in interest-based borrowing. Or whatever it may be, right or wrong. He says, and so if you're coming sincerely saying, I have a need for this book, Allah will open up for you so many angles in this book. Another example, uh, in Surah Yusuf, because us as a community, you guys may remember that we went through Surah Yusuf uh, week by week, and so it has a special place in many of our hearts now. Uh, when they came to Yusuf alayhi salam, 
And they said to him, you know, we're stuck. We need a meaning for this dream. He told them this dream means there's about to be a famine in Egypt. It's about to get real nasty for the next seven, seven years. Uh, or for seven years straight. They asked him for what? For a solution. What do we do? This is a man in prison, right? He gives them unconditional advice. He doesn't stipulate that they acquit him. That was later. When they wanted to hire him, he said, no, prove my innocence first. But when people's lives were on the line, he didn't say, you forgot about me in prison. He didn't say, I was wrongly, you know, uh, I was framed. I w he didn't say any of this. You guys need my help. This is my help. Unconditional advice. Many of us have a need to sort of trim down on our egos a little bit. That the world does not revolve around us. If you come to the Quran seeking out your needs, even if you have not quite identified them yet, you may be able to identify them through the Quran, through your tadabbur. Is that clear? So that's the first thing. Uh, the disclosures will happen as you explore. The second thing I want to tell you, uh, or the third now, so we said isti'adha, you know, come with your, try to have your needs in mind. The third thing is, try to, and we've already done this a little bit, always draw parallels. Draw parallels between you, the story in front of you and your own personal story. You know, they say that uh, belief in the Quran requires that you believe that every ayah has a lesson for every person. It's your job to find it. Every single ayah has a lesson for you personally. Now go get it. Go retrieve it. And so if I were to go back to the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, for example, we, we discussed together how there was a parallel, almost like a symmetry, in the beginning of the story and the end of the story. In the beginning of the story when he told his father the dream, right? I saw in a dream, eleven the sun and the moon, 11 stars prostrating to me. He said, your Lord is going to really distinguish you and don't, you know, tell your brothers and all of this. And he said to him, that's how your Lord wishes to elevate you. Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. Your Lord is knowing wise. And then he's abducted and sold and imprisoned and uh, with, you know, a high office in the government. And, and then the reunion happens. He says to his father, what? This was my dream. Allah made it a reality. Indeed, my Lord is Alim Hakim. He says back to his dad those same two names of Allah. Allah is knowing wise. So when you, if you pay attention and you look for parallels, you look for patterns, you look for matching, you say, oh, subhanAllah. You know, it's as if his father carving in him, in his personality, in his psyche, in his heart, those two names of Allah, that's what got him to survive that 40-year journey, right? Look for parallels. There are huge secrets in them. You know, uh, one of the scholars, he mentions that uh, you find an entire surah, the longest surah in the Quran, named after the incident of what? The cow, right? A surah named after a cow. Some people, first glance, <laughs> you introduce to the Quran, why does the Quran talk about the cows and the Quran is talking about the honeybee, and, right? Life lessons. You see, because Banu Israel, it was like a, can I call it a watershed moment? <laughs> Banu Israel were so stubborn about not slaughtering this cow, right? They were trying to loophole and deflect and sort of argue and find any reason not to slaughter the cow. And Banu Israel are the people who nationalize their religion and they say, we are the bloodline of who? Abraham. And if you look, Abraham was the one that was willing to slaughter his son, not a cow. Right or wrong? How dare you attribute yourself to Abraham? And that's why the Quran says in, in the next surah, Inna awla nasi bi Ibrahim The people that have the truest claim to Abraham are the ones who follow his footsteps. Right? And so you have a, a slaughter and a slaughter. One of them is a cow, the other one is your own son. He complies and they don't comply. Right or wrong? And so you look for these sort of 
patterns to help you work through these meanings. The, the fourth, uh, you know, tip or key to tafsir or like tadabbur in general, understanding meanings of the Qur'an is that when you read any surah, you try to identify the overall theme or major themes of the surah, okay? Every surah has a theme or themes that are paramount, that are most obvious about it. In fact, they say that's why it was called a surah. You know the word surah with a scene. Surah is an image. Surah, the Quran, every chapter is called a surah. Surah comes from the word sur. Sur means what? What's a sur? Huh? A fence or a gate, right? And so Allah called his chapters suar. Why? They said perhaps he is calling our attention to the fact that I very deliberately fenced off this set of verses from that set of verses. You get it? Why couldn't the Quran be a salient stream of its 6,000 plus verses? Why is this surah separated from that surah? There's a secret there. Because there are themes that are bundled, packaged within each surah. Does that make sense? Is that clear? And I'll give you an example how this can open up meanings for you. Surah Ar-Rahman. It begins with what? Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. The name of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then it ends with what? What's the very last verse? This is an easy exercise. Tabarak asmu rabbik. Blessed is the name of your Lord. Which name? Ar-Rahman, the one it began with, right? And that means, you see these two poles? Everything within this surah now should be read in light of Allah's name, Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. You say, wait a minute. But Surah Ar-Rahman has mention of Allah's hellfire. There are secrets there. Allah's hellfire being His punishment and a manifestation of His anger there are several dimensions of mercy in the hellfire. The believers will be grateful when they see their seats in their hellfire not occupied, right? The believers will be grateful when they see that the vengeance and the justice they were not allotted in this world from their, the tyrants and oppressors, they see themselves avenged, right? That's a blessing and a mercy, isn't it? Alongside other manifestations of Allah's mercy, uh, we know uh, from elsewhere in the Quran. And so once you identify the theme of the surah, you start reading the surah with a different uh, lens, if you will. So try to keep a bird's eye view from the surah uh, to capture what's happening. You know, if I were to just jump back to Surah Yusuf very quickly, uh, you know, the scholars mentioned that Yusuf alayhi salam, there's a, a theme of the different types of tests Allah azza wa jal puts people through in, his li in their life in, in order of difficulty. Like the first test Yusuf alayhi salam went through was the test of qadr, the test of like destined hardships. You can't do anything about it. If you're wise, you'll just accept it, whether you're Muslim or not, because it's not going to change anything, right? To just kill yourself over spilt milk, right? And so that's, in a sense, the, the simplest of tests, okay? Then you move on, and then he gets tested by the wife of Al-Aziz who tries to seduce him, and that was a more difficult test. Why is it a more difficult test? Because it's voluntary, right? The first one, I got thrown in the well, I got thrown in the well. It's over. Might as well accept. Or else I'll just frustrate myself and I'll end up accepting anyway down the line. Against my will. But with the wife of Al-Aziz, when he says, prison is more beloved to me than what they call me to, this is a superior act of patience with that test. Perseverance. I chose it. I chose the path of righteousness, right? 
it's obligatory, but still, it's a voluntary act to align yourself with Allah's obligation. Right? You move on. Now, his brothers come back and they, they do more than throw shade. They even accuse him again without knowing he's Yusuf. They do so much. Right? And he suppresses all of that. And then when finally the, the climax of the story happens, he actually forgives them. And that's a very difficult test. Right? That's a hard, even harder test in a sense. It could be argued to be more difficult because you don't have to forgive people. Right? It's obligatory to not commit zina. Is it obligatory to, you know, let someone go who hurt you? No. You can re request the justice, fair justice in this world. You could request that your rights be vindicated in this dunya. It's superior sometimes if someone's remorseful to forgive them, but it's not obligatory. So that's like a step up now, <laughs> right? And then the, there's a fourth test that most people not just overlook in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, but they overlook in their own lives as well. Actually, Sayyid Qutb rahimahullah, he mentions it beautifully in Al-Dilal, in his commentary in prison, subhanAllah, on the shade of the Quran, right? Uh, what's that final test? There's one more test. It's actually very hard to notice. The test of prosperity. That's the one everybody fails. <laughs> right? We're all close to Allah Azza wa Jal between a rock and a hard place. We're all close to Allah, you know, when we're, we're stuck. But at the very end, at the happy ending, if I recall correctly, uh, Sayyid Qutb rahimahullah, he says, he says, and before, he, he was very visual and, you know, the imagery in his writing is always beautiful. He says, but before the curtains of the story fall, for the last time, there was one more test that was essentially snuck in front of Yusuf alayhi salam. And that was the test of ease. See, the test of, of, of patience could be tough. But what's tougher is the test of ease where you have to be grateful. That's a much harder test. Far more people fail that test. The test of health, the test of riches, the test of power. Don't we say, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely? Don't we say that in English? So when he had power now... That is when you fail more than any other scenario. But right as soon as it happened, what did he do? The ayah says, Yusuf alayhi salam essentially turns to the side. This is implied. And he says, Rabbi, my Lord, قَدْ آتَيْتَنِي مِنَ الْمُلْكِ You granted me kingdom. وَعَلَّمْتَنِي مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ And you taught me how to interpret events or dreams of events. تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ uh, you are the originator of the heavens and the earth we, were, we weren't even a thought you brought us all into existence to begin with before these great blessings you even created me to begin with and everything around me then he says you are my true guardian you are my master in this world and the next you know he's even saying this in front of his father like at that moment, your reunion with your dad, your dad is your Islamic guardian, by the way. <laughs> like he is your wali and he's your ally and he's your ever. He says, oh Allah, you're my guardian. Above all else, in this world and the next, musliman wa Now allow me to pass this final test, basically. Allow me, he says, to die as a Muslim. And allow me to catch up with the righteous. So when, when you try to step back and say, what, what is happening, bird's eye view, in the surah here, the progress of the surah, the, the linear progression of the surah, the themes of the surah, sometimes the symmetry in the surah, it gives you many doors to reflect, even in translation. All right? So that was number four, bird's eye view. Number five, I'll try to finish quickly, is just keep a measured pace. You know when Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا And recite the Qur'an in measured, uh, measured breaths, right? In, in, in a slow measure. You know, uh, the, even Ramadan is coming, we, we get sucked in sometimes to the, the chase to end the page. Just forget that. 
You know, the, the early Muslims used to have like two sets of like weird, like through to get through, make sure I don't forget the Quran, I'm reviewing it. So they're going through the Quran once a week, maybe less, maybe more, but basically once a week. So many of the early Muslims, the Salaf, used to do that. But they would have another khatma, another read through of the Quran that they didn't time, right? It wasn't about solidifying their memory, it was about getting into the meanings. If that one khatma took them 24 years, 25, they don't care. It's not the point. And no one can say that this khatma is any less worse, any less worth the 15, 20, 30 khatmas they made, 50 khatmas they made each year at a fast pace. Because the point is to get to the meanings. Number six, make time, make time to, to snap out of, uh, you, you know, just the, the mundanity is like the downfall of, <laughs> of human enjoyment. When you just, something becomes regular, something becomes mundane, if you don't shift, you just, you do it unconsciously. And to become unconscious, to be distracted, to be not mindful, this is the killer of any act of worship. You know, Allah says about Hajj, one of the greatest acts of worship, it's not the blood that you're sacrificing is going to get to Allah, but what's going to get to Allah is what? The taqwa, the consciousness of your heart, right? The fasting, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So you may become better conscious of Allah Azza wa Jal. Zakah, Allah says, تُطَهِرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا It is about purifying you there, right? The salah is there, li dhikri, so you may become mindful of Allah. So that is like the epicenter of where you want to be in an act of worship. You want to be circling around with Quran, it's pretty straightforward, right? That's the whole point of the Quran, we need you to be thinking. And so to reset, to reset, and to, to tell yourself, these are the words of Allah. I'm not just reading just anything. And that may require, you know, uh, mental uh, what's the word mental safeguards because if you, if you read the Quran at times of fatigue or times of distraction the, you know you're full on your stomach or the phone is ringing in with messages while you're trying to read your Quran on your phone it, it's not going to work you're just going to be so superficial in the recitation Malik ibn Dinar rahimahullah, when some of his students would be reciting to him he would sometimes just stop them in their tracks, almost interrupt them in their recitation and say, Isma'u ila ma yaqulu sadiqu min fawqi arshi. Listen, listen to what the truthful one is saying from on top of his throne. Because you know when the weight of that hits you or hits you anew, you refresh, oh yeah, this is Allah speaking from above the sky. It's different. So to help yourself, help each other, reset that realization that these are Allah's words. You know Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhum, he also uh, has a beautiful statement. When Allah said, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ We made the Qur'an easy to be remembered. Or, yeah, remembered. He said, commenting on this ayah, listen, he says, لَوْلَا أَنْ يَسَّرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى لِسَانِ الْآدَمِيِّينَ Had Allah not facilitated the recitation of the Qur'an on the tongues of the human beings, the children of Adam, Adamiyin, no one of the creatures would have been able to utter the words of God. Right? Because how does that even make sense? How can a created being have the ability to repeat the words of the Creator Himself? Should that even be expected? You guys are staring at me like... Look guys, if... Uh, if a peregrine falcon, we have some peregrine falcons back here, so I'm just going to like throw a, uh, a curveball at you. If a peregrine falcon flew in, okay, and snatched the microphone from me and gave the rest of my lecture, what would you guys think? Besides the fact that you're under the influence. <laughs> what else would you think? It's a miracle. Why is it a miracle? Because falcons don't speak Shinawi. That's it. Falcons don't speak human, right or wrong. Now, how does human speak the word of God? Because the, the distance between us and God is far greater than the distance between us and falcon. Right or wrong? For an animal to speak human is unthinkable. So how can you think it's normal? 
That's what Ibn Abbas is trying to tell you. How can you ever think, get desensitized, it's normal that I get to say God's words? So you reset that realization that, oh man, this is, you know, this is a privilege. Allah sort of just facilitated it as a gift. We haven't earned, we shouldn't have expected it, but it's just a gift. Take it as such. That was number six. Reset the realization. Figure out ways to do that. <sighs> Obviously changing up the surahs as well. Changing up your posture when you're sleepy as well. Whatever it's going to be, right? To refresh your, uh, your mindset. Number seven, you obviously need a reliable translation. I mean, this one sort of goes without saying, but I, I'm going to say it anyway, right? You're not going to be reflecting on the sounds, you know? Uh, I heard one time that like one brother, like when he wants to like, I don't know, spiritually amplify himself, he gets like, he has this playlist of the adhan from so many different reciters. Tab, fine, okay. Do you know the words of the adhan, what they mean? No, I don't, <laughs> right? But tab, there's <laughs> a big gap here. There's a gaping hole. There's a huge canyon. You know, Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah, he used to say, Ata'ajjab. Imam al-Tabari is a famous tafsir scholar. One of the first ever in Islamic history. He says, I'm amazed at how someone can enjoy the Quran without studying its meanings. Of course, At-Tabari, rahimahullah, he knows. Don't misunderstand. Don't be hyperbolic, as they say. He doesn't mean that there's no enjoyment whatsoever in simply the recitation of the Quran, even if you don't understand Arabic. You see this on YouTube, these famous reciters, you go into the top comment, it's people saying, I'm not even Muslim, but this is how I go to sleep now. It gives me so much peace. And I, he, he gets that too. He understands that. But he's saying compared to what is available of delight in understanding God's messages to you, there's almost no enjoyment at all. It doesn't compare. The simple enjoyment of the recitation, as beautiful as you may think it is, wait till you discover the meanings. So does that mean I have to like enroll in a course for tafsir? No, you don't. That would be great. You should. But you don't have to. Every translation of the Quran is already a tafsir, already a commentary. Because the, the translator is understanding and then relaying to you his understanding in another language. Right? And so it is understanding. But there's a few things. The deeper you go, the more you get. Right? It's by effort. You know, sometimes it's not even like deeper meaning reading more and more commentaries or getting more and more knowledgeable per se. Sometimes your dedication just spending time on this, what exactly does this mean? I don't get it. And you spend more and more and more time on it. I say, oh man, it's so simple. How, how didn't I get it before? You begin to realize that, oh, I just hadn't deserved it yet. Right? It's not about like how good you are. It's about how, how, how bad you want it, how much you're trying. You know, they, they say the Qur'an's messages are like a good friend, uh, but a good, even a good friend will not just tell you everything on the, on the first day. After a while, then they start disclosing the secrets to you. And another one of the scholars used to say, the Qur'an will not give you a part of it, a gem, a nugget, until you give it all of yourself, right? And so try to give the Qur'an your whole attention and try to exert an effort. Trouble yourself a little bit. But if you wish to go wider and not just deeper, right? Go wider. I actually am very happy uh, to discover that the tafsir, one of the best tafsir uh, that I, I consult and I enjoy, the tafsir of uh, the late Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Saadi, rahimahullah, has finally been translated into English. So if you don't have access to Arabic, uh, IIPH, Islam, International Islamic Publishing House, has translated, and their translations are, are very good quality. Translation. The language is very accessible. It's not clunky translation. It's very nice. So Tafsir al-Sa'adi is available. You can buy it. You can read through some of it with yourself, with your family, in preparation and during Ramadan. That's uh, definitely something I would recommend. But then there's also Sira. That's the last thing I'll say about, you know, consulting uh, the meanings. The Qur'an, if you read the Qur'an and you're paying attention, the Qur'an presumes that you know some background information. Easiest example, there's 60 ayat in Surah Ali Imran, straight, about the battle of Uhud. They make no mention of Uhud whatsoever, meaning the word, the term Uhud. So the Quran expects of you to know some context, to know what it's about and just general background information. It expects that of you. And so if you don't have that, you need to develop it. You need to develop it. 
And that is why Muhammad, the son of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, so like a son of the companion of the Prophet والسلام, used to say that they used to teach us the battles, and of course his life, so much of it was subhanAllah, uh, riddled with jihad and warfare and, and otherwise. So battles means biography a lot of times, right? We were taught the battles of the Prophet والسلام, the same way we were taught a surah from the Quran. That's how the early Muslims did it. It was hand in hand. Because they sort of tell of each other. They speak of each other. Number, what number are we up to? Oh, mashallah, someone's actually counting. I love it. Uh, so number seven was consult yourself on the, uh, consult the meanings. Brief yourself on the meanings. Number eight, I already sort of dipped in and out of this subject, which is when you're reading, you give the Quran your undivided attention. I said airplane mode. I said, you know, not when you're too tired. Find quiet time. Find peaceful time. Find focused time. You know when the Quran speaks encouraging people to recite Quran at night, in Qiyamul Layl, in the night prayers, what does it say? What's the justification? Inna al-layl, the depths of the night, ashaddu wata'an, is better for concurrence. Wata'a means a step. So like basically, it's how the, 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 the stride <laughs> synchronizes, right? W meaning what? It's when your tongue concurs with your heart, right? Wata'an means concurrence happens. What you're saying with your tongue is actually being said with your heart or heard by your heart or reflected on by your heart. So the night, because of just the calmness of the night, becomes more helpful for concurrence. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for concurrence. You're trying to line it up. Is that clear? Uh, because, you know, not every believer gets to have access to this. D doesn't Allah say in Surah Qaf, uh, in this is a great reminder, dhikra, for whoever's heart is alive, so that's like the believers in general, or is giving it an ear while they're attentive. Right? Because in other words, maybe your heart is dead, that's why you're not being reminded by it. For the believers, that's not the case, alhamdulillah. Or the other one, he is giving it his ear while he is or she is present minded. And that is also why some of the scholars said Allah Azza wa Jal called his book Aziz, a mighty book, for several reasons. One of the reasons that the book itself is mighty, can't be uh, dominated, can't be changed, right? can't be falsified. It's a formidable book. But they said Aziz also, and Aziz does mean this in the Arabic language, Aziz implies pride. When say someone is Aziz, it means he has a sense of pride. They're proud. And that could be positive or negative, right? There's different kinds of pride. So the Quran is a proud book, meaning what? It refuses to have the leftovers of your attention. You give it just like the, what, the leftovers, it will not give you much. It's Aziz. You either give it or it's not... Uh, going to reveal its, its secrets with you. The ninth and last one, finally, is your spiritual health. Detoxing this for eligibility when you're reciting the Quran. You know, for instance, when Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, سأصرف عن آياتي, I will divert from my signs. They won't notice them. الذين يتكبرون في الأرض بغير الحق those who are arrogant on this earth without having any right to do so. And nobody has a right to do so. Or when Allah Azza wa Jal says about this Quran, you know the verse we started with, it has a mercy and a cure for the believers. Allah said, وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا And it doesn't increase the wrongdoers except in loss. So to the extent that you are a wrongdoer, you lose out on benefiting from this Quran. And you know, a third anecdote or a third evidence for this point of the importance of, you know, performing tawbah and asking Allah to forgive you and asking Allah to open for you the gates of His mercy, asking Allah to benefit you with His book. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah has a, uh, a really cool uh, 
sort of uh, connection he makes on this issue. He says, the Prophet والسلام, said to us, this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, said to us, Inna la baytan fihi suratun wa la kalb. The angels don't enter a house in which there is an image or a dog. If you got images hung up, you got a dog in the house, angels don't enter that house. He said, Ibn Taymiyyah says, check this out. He's not the only one, but uh, this was reported by, uh, about you know, Al-Bukhari and, and others. Uh, so he said, an, an angel is a created being. Doesn't enter the house when there's images and dogs. So how can knowing Allah deeply and importing the sweetness of faith and you know, enjoying his book ever enter a heart that is filled with the images of worldly attachment, you're obsessed with this world, right? That's of the diseases of the heart, right? Infatuated with this world. He says the images of worldly attachments, he says, and the dogs of desires. Like if you always have your lusts and your appetites barking at you, you can't ignore them. They always have you on your heels. They always have you, you're undivided. Then how will you ever enjoy the Quran if your heart is infested with these things? So it was a nice analogy he struck there. And you know, Imam al-Bukhari and others, they pulled it from the ayah where Allah says about the Quran, uh, إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ It is a honorable book. فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٍ In a preserved tablet. So meaning the original Quran is protected in the heavens, inscribed in the heavens. فِي كِتَابٍ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرُونَ None touches it except the purified ones, the ones that got purified. So almost all the scholars say, who are the purified ones here? The angels. They're the purified ones, so they're able to have access and come in contact with the original Quran, right? The master copy that's in Allah al mahfud that's in the heavens. But why did Allah tell us this? The majority of scholars said, it is an indirect, it's not the only proof, Yani, for this ruling, but it's of the indirect ways Allah is telling you, Purify yourself before you hold the book. Imam al-Bukhari took it on a different angle. He didn't say that. He's not disagreeing with this, but he added a layer to it. He said, and perhaps Allah is telling us the same way only the purest angels can, are allowed to come in contact with this Quran. Only the purest hearts can have access to the reality of the Quran. Can get deep into this book. And so, you know, again, renew your repentance, seek, make istighfar, seek forgiveness from Allah before you sit down with his book, ask him, appeal to him that he open up for you his gates. As the Prophet ﷺ did, now close with that. Didn't he say, sallallahu alayhi wa that no uh, servant is plagued with worry or grief? And then he says the following dua. I'm going to say for you the dua in a second, the supplication. Except that Allah will replace his grief with peace. And replace his anxiety or worries with reassurance. They said, Ya Rasulullah, should we learn this dua? He said, everyone who hears this dua should learn it. What is the dua? It is... Allahumma inni abduk wa abnu abdik wa abnu amatik. Oh Allah, I am your servant and the son of your servant and the son of your female servant. Meaning mom, dad, grandparents, beyond all of us. We're all in a chain, no exceptions. We are all your subjects, oh Allah. We are all powerless servants before you. Wa abnu amatik. Nasiyati biyadik. My forelock is in your hands. Meaning you can direct me however you wish. Nasiyati biyadik. Maldin fiya hukmuk. Adilun fiya qadauk. Your judgment on me is always carried out. Your verdict about me is always fair. Here it comes now. As'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa lak. I ask you by every name that is yours. Sammayta bihi nafsak that you've named yourself with. Aw anzaltahu fi kitabik or you've sent it down in one of your scriptures. Aw allamtahu ahadan min khalqik or you've taught it to one of your creation. Aw istatharta bihi fi ilm al-ghaybi indak. 
or you've kept it reserved in the knowledge of the unseen that is with you and تجعل القرآن ربيع قلبي that I'm asking you by all this that you make the Quran the spring of my heart the water that irrigates my heart the spring of my heart ربيع قلبي ونور صدري and the light of my chest وجلاء حزني and the removal of my sadness وذهاب همي and the departure of my anxieties or my, my worries ask Allah for this this is a beautiful way to do it do it that way the way he taught us عليه الصلاة والسلام so those are nine and next session inshallah we have very special guests next Friday but the session after that we will talk about why the Quran tells stories the way it does the unique storytelling style of the Quran in particular and how to appreciate it inshallah azza wa jal jazakallahu khairan wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in